Okay, well, it is 12 o'clock. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 2022 Indiana Small Farm Conference webinar session for Wednesday, March 30th. This is our regenerative agriculture session for the series. Um, and for this program, we have assembled a distinguished panel of farmers and professionals to discuss what regenerative agriculture means to them and how they implement practices in their farms and businesses. Um, so my name is Andrew Westfall. I'm with the Purdue Extension Service in White County, Indiana, and I'll be moderating the session today. Also, I wanted to recognize Azad Kehal, who helped plan this session and may be chiming in as well. Azad is our Ag and Natural Resources Extension Educator in LaPorte County, Indiana. Also helping out today will be James Wolf, Ag and Natural Resources Extension Educator in Allen County, Indiana. Move the slide here. Okay, whoops, one too many. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors for the program. We have a long history of great partners and support around the state to be able to pull off this conference um, each year. So we certainly wanna take a moment to recognize them. Um, so please take note of our, our generous sponsors here in this slide. We would also like to request that you as participants take time to let us know who you are by taking our demographic survey. Um, by using the QR code posted here on the screen, you can scan that with your phone or by clicking on the link posted in the chat um, by James here. And I'll leave this here for a moment to let you grab that code. Um, as this mentions, we are uh, required to report race, ethnicity, and gender of program participants by the, the USDA, so we really appreciate you taking the time to to let us know a little bit about yourself. Okay, hopefully everybody grabbed that. And if not, again, it should be in the chat box. Um, and we would also like to specifically thank our lead sponsor for today, North Central SARE, um, which stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Um, SARE is a great partner for us and can be a great resource for farmers. So if you have not connected with SARE or looked into their mission, I would highly encourage you to do so as it fits in great with our session here today. Stop sharing for a moment. Um, so to get started with our session today, I'm going to provide some brief introductions. Uh, then each of our panelists is going to have some time to provide a background of who they are and what they do. Um, before we get into more of a structured panel discussion. And we should have some, some time for some more open-ended question and answer um, towards the end of the session. But in the meantime, um, please drop any questions you have in the chat box, and we'll try and work those into the discussion as we go along. Uh, and as, just as a reminder, if you could also please remember to mute your microphones until the question and answer portion of the program. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel and thank them for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, with us today, we have Elliot Dale. Um, Elliot manages Maple Hill Farm, a very diversified farm in West Point, Indiana, just outside of West Lafayette. Um, we'll let Elliot explain a little bit more about his operation. Um, and you, remember, you may remember Elliot from last year's conference um, where he walked us through some of the unique features on his farm via a virtual farm tour. Um, and we look forward to hearing from him again shortly. Also with us returning to the 2022 Small Farm Conference, we are happy to welcome Karen Vanek. Um, she is the nursery division manager for Forest Agriculture Nursery, as well as the senior project coordinator for rest restoration agriculture development, um, both headquartered in Viola, Wisconsin. For the past 12 years, she has been a part of designing and installing food systems from intensive quarter acre edible landscapes to dynamic ecological agricultural systems spanning hundreds of acres and tens of thousands of crop producing trees and shrubs with an emphasis on hazelnuts and chestnuts in establishing integrative staple foods cropping systems. Um, she has a lot of experience with this subject here today, so we'll let her delve into that more over the next hour or so. Our third panel member today is Michael O'Donnell. 
uh, Michael, some of our past conference attendees may recognize as he's a former Purdue Extension educator who did a lot of work in this area and was vital in getting this conference where it is today. Uh, Michael wears several hats. Um, currently, he's the farm certification manager at Living Prairie Family Farms in Wolcott, Indiana, a large-scale diversified organic grain operation. Um, and he's also the regenerative agriculture coordinator for the Div Diverse Corn Belt Project in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Purdue University, um, which is a USDA and NEFA-funded multidisciplinary project to bring together agriculture stakeholders in Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa um, to explore how a more diversified agriculture system in the Midwest could be more resilient and sustainable than the current corn and soybean dominant system. Um, he is also the owner of Recovery Agriculture LLC, which offers agricultural consulting services to farmers and organizations seeking to transition to regenerative and organic farming systems. Um, so there's a brief introduction, but at this time I'd like to go around and hear from our panel. And if you could just take five minutes or so um, per person to tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do, and then we'll get started into some of the more specific questions. Um, so Elliot, would you mind kicking us off? I already have you on the, the screen here. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, I operate a small farm in Tippecanoe County, which is outside of West Lafayette. Uh, we're on 30 acres and we do, well, I've done quite a few different things in the past. Uh, we're currently focused mainly on vegetable and mushroom production. Uh, we've, we've done some management intensive grazing with cattle, sheep, uh, pastured pigs, poultry. Um, but currently, my main focus is we have about an eighth of an acre in, I'd say, cash crop vegetable production. We have some other small pieces that are in rotation of cover crop to become in vegetable production. And then um, we also have some small, I'd say permaculture systems on site that really I've established mainly for uh, just biodiversity and pollinator ideas and things for our, but ma focusing mainly on our vegetable side of the farm. And then uh, we have some wooded acreage that we pasture pigs in and do some mushroom production. Um, and part of the farm is in an organic no-till uh, row crop system, but I really don't have a, a big part in that other than just kind of consulting with the farmer, we basically farm down the halves. But we, I did spend quite a few years prepping that field for that system. So definitely have a lot of experience in management intensive grazing with cattle and sheep, spent five years prepping that land. But um, my current emphasis is on mainly vegetable and mushroom production, just to local small scale marketing, mainly restaurants and a couple small grocery stores. So um, I appreciate being part of this. Uh, hope I can answer any questions that people might have and maybe throw in some ideas and other things that we've done here. Uh, so thank you. All right, thank you, Elliot. Um, Karen, would you care to go next? Sure thing. If you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I just threw together a few slides just to provide a little bit more context uh, of some personal things that might not be included on a generic biography that you might see on the internet. And so right now I'm headquartered out in Viola, Wisconsin. That is in the Driftless region of Wisconsin. That's this whole beautiful area where it's a lot of karst habitat, a lot of historical oak hickory savanna. And this is a snapshot of new forest farm. And so this is this incredible polyculture system that I farm amongst. And so I operate this nursery and embedded within this system here. And this is a top of approximately 106 acres in total, where the most majority of what we do is manage uh, 
perennial tree crops in, uh, in context to this oak hickory savanna mimic that we've got going here. And so with our nursery breeding practices, uh, perhaps some folks have heard of the term mass selection breeding. Uh, we're just, it's basically land race breeding. And so we're always uh, observing what's going on in our environment and honoring the population fitness of these uh, hazelnuts, chestnuts, and other plants that we grow. And also simultaneously checking out individual plant performance. So that's what I've been doing for the past eight plus years directly with this farm. And so what brought me to this? My gosh, <laughs> I used to do uh, protein biochemistry and I used to be one of those people that would be a lab technician doing a gene editing. And so I come from this interesting background that led me to take uh, like from this research realm to this situation where learning about um, how it is to work with these uh, living organisms and the way that we tinker and how these responses um, so uh, this genetic modification route <laughs> I might have some personal uh, opinions on like this whole particular route that came from that but what it drove me to so you might see on the left hand side that's me in my old suburban backyard uh, sneaking in some chickens <laughs> so I just had this drive this motivation to start integrating uh, these elements of where does my food come from how do I maintain nutrition so how does that relate to the biochemistry research I was doing that was toted as trying to help people be healthy by finding uh, pharmaceutical solutions uh, to the ailments that they were suffering from. And it tr directly transitioned me into wanting to make a more broad-based solution into focusing on starting with organic farming, uh, which has led me down this uh, regenerative egg rabbit hole. In the middle, that's a picture of me with some of our bare root seedlings. Uh, those happen to be hazelnuts. And I also, with Restoration Agriculture Development, that's a consultation group that I work with. On the far right-hand side, that's Mark Shepard. Uh, and in the middle happens to be Greg Burns of Nature's Image Farm. But we were just on, so what I do a lot now is project management and setting up these ecological templates for people to perform uh, more readily uh, healing agricultural practices, uh, restorative agriculture, uh, called be it regenerative ag. And quick personal bit about me, I've been practicing and learning violin and otherwise just integrating my life uh, as a part of getting really intimate of where my food comes from and how to process it. So pretty good with stacking wood now <laughs> and monitoring uh, budgeting and how to cook food off of a wood stove and off of the, the animals that we uh, grow on the farm as well. They're a whole part of the system. It's not just the nursery. And just uh, always being a student of this planet. And so over the winter, this is just a uh, example of some of these new observations. So we fresh cut some uh, apple wood. Um, we're going to smoke some pork, I think, <laughs> that came from the farm. Uh, but this is um, a result of rabbits uh, consuming that because it was pretty harsh winter. Um, so how do I assimilate that stuff into my everyday world and how to manage these ecological systems and realize my uh, continuously adapting role in that. Uh, lastly, this is just a book that's been hot on my mind lately. Uh, curious if anyone has gone through this too. Uh, but this has been a really interesting eye opener into how I relate to regenerative ag too. And that's the gist of what I've got going on lately in my world. Thank you for listening, everybody. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, fascinating stuff, and we'll hear plenty more from Karen um, throughout the afternoon. So, uh, Michael, would you care to share a little bit more about yourself? Sure, yeah, I've got some slides as well. Let me attempt this. Let's see, it's going to... Okay, can you see that? Is it a full full screen slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, first, Karen, thank you for, for sharing 
those details, some of your background and what you're doing currently and how you're integrating this across your life. I appreciate that. And I got a little overexcited with putting some slides together because I, I want to share some of the same because I think it's important just for setting the context of our conversation. Uh, I think context is a big word that comes up in discussions around regenerative agriculture. Uh, and I think for those of us who are sharing our thoughts on this rather broad reaching topic of regenerative agriculture, I think it's useful for those who are listening today to have, have a good feel for what informs our thinking and where we're at today on our journey, uh, unique journey as it relates to regenerative agriculture and how we incorporate that and, and use that to inform our life. Um, so that's me standing in the field of organic corn. Uh, that's actually at one of the pre research farms and some work that I was involved with previously. But uh, I'm going to give some quick background on myself and then things currently going on with the farm that I work with. And then I want to share uh, some quotes and things that are maybe a little more thought provoking. Uh, I hesitate to think that today I have any solutions for many for anybody here, but I hope that at least uh, I can offer some things to get you thinking maybe a little bit differently. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is just a shot from the farm where I'm currently employed part-time. It's, it's called Living Prairie Family Farms. The owner is Jason Fetter. It's about 30 minutes north, drive north of the uh, West Lafayette campus, free university campus. It's some of the most productive soils on the planet, really. It's flat, black soil. Um, amazing to get to work with, with, um, with soils like this. Uh, but it's a, it's a flat, open landscape. Um, I often describe it as being a rather exploited landscape. We often find that the, the most, the, the areas on, on this planet that are the most productive and uh, soils and easiest to produce crops from are often the most exploited and most of the landscape is covered in corn soybeans under conventional management and wind turbines. Um, but uh, the acreage that we're working with at Living Prairie Family Farms we're trying to manage a little bit differently with more diversity and and uh, it's all shifted into certified organic production over the last oh seven years or so. Uh, in the intro, Andrew mentioned my involvement working part time with a USDA funded project housed at a Purdue University, but involving multiple institutions uh, called the Diverse Corn Belt Project. And I'm not going to dive into details here, but looking broadly, more systemically, high level at uh, diversity at the farm level, market level, and landscape level, doing some on farm research, focus group, and stakeholder outreach. Um, modeling, extension efforts, and so forth. If, if you'd like to learn more about this, happy to share more details, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, we will soon have a website up where you'll, you'll have more information about the project and, and some of the things that we'll be doing in the coming years. Lastly, I have a little consulting business on the side called Recovery Agriculture LLC. Uh, and I'm not gonna plug that now, but uh, if you're interested, Happy to talk about those opportunities as well. So like Karen, uh, I, I sort of shifted from a different career career and education background. In my case, I have a couple of degrees in mechanical engineering, uh, spent some time in industry working on control systems and alternative fuel systems for diesel engines. Um, so truly a mechanical mind, as I like to say, uh, but it did help me develop kind of systems thinking uh, more from a mechanical standpoint, but it's, it's been useful to me in agriculture. Um, but my, my first experiences with agriculture in my mid-20s was when I was in graduate school, I was studying uh, biofuels at the time that the renewable fuel standard was ramping up and first coming into play in the early mid-2000s, which mandated increasing volumes of biofuels in our transportation system, our liquid fuel system, mostly corn ethanol, soy biodiesel, look at those from a life cycle standpoint and look at some historical fuel transitions as, as sort of policy learning 
examples for how this whole biofuel transition would play out. Uh, and it just, I had to look at conventional corn and soybean production, and that really opened my eyes to, uh, you know, I was coming from a lens of sustainable energy, alternative energy, and then I sort of, um, you know, I had to look at corn production, soybean production, and it really had me asking a lot of questions. And, and then I, I, I just went down the rabbit hole of exploring alternative agriculture production systems. And then found myself working at a farm in, in Austin where I was going to grad school. This is a medium scale certified organic, highly diversified uh, vegetable operation that I was involved with. Uh, sadly, I just learned that la late, late last summer, this operation shut down after nearly 20 years of operation and being sort of a, a, a cornerstone of, of organic agriculture in central Texas and the Southern states. That was, that's where I sort of got the bug of farming and, and just never looked back. Um, we produced some beautiful food there and, and provided the, the central Texas communities with a lot of, of high quality food. I came back to Indiana where I'm from, worked with Adam Moody. Uh, some of you may know Moody, Moody Meats. I worked on the farm with his, his son for a couple of years, helping with operations, crop production, a production, beef, poultry, eggs, lamb, pork, and then work some in their state inspected slaughter facility as well for a couple of years. Um, highly diverse rotation, crop livestock integration, pretty neat stuff. Uh, then for about seven or eight years, developed a small part-time market farm with my family, retailing direct to consumers, half acre of production in vegetables. You can see the overhead shot here with a couple tunnels that, that we moved doing four season production. Um, decided to move on, on from that for a variety of reasons, but um, um, <clears throat> as I think Ellie can attest to, um, this market farming style of vegetable production is, is pretty labor intensive and demands a lot. When you're trying to do it part time, it becomes pretty challenging. I uh, spent my, my last bit of work with Purdue prior to what I'm doing currently was, was with Extension, as many of you know, as an organic agriculture extension educator. And my favorite part of that work was really just getting farmers together to learn from one another. I think that's um, that carries through today to kind of how I approach my, my work, even with the farm. And maintain a pretty wide network and constantly far talking with other farmers and just making sure we we're learning from an, each other and I'm, I'm still trying to contribute to to ways to bring farmers together to learn and support one another because um, at times um, we get quite isolated and I think it's just it's it's important to find those opportunities to stay connected not just just to learn but to, to really support each other So back to the farm, uh, in terms of uh, the farm I currently work with, Living Prairie Family Farms, Jason Federer, um, it is by no means a small farm. I know that this is a small farm conference, but um, you know, this is where I currently find myself working. And so we're spread out on about 4,100 acres. You can, the fields that are outlined there uh, here on, on Google Maps in the different colors, um, our farms that are our fields that we operate on, uh, you can see that we have a big chunk of ground that's contiguous, which I think is really advantageous to the organic management system that we've developed, trying to have those acres within close proximity and to limit buffer areas that we need relative to conventional acres that surround us. But then we have, we do have a number of isolated fields that are a little bit further. As mentioned, all of it's uh, been in transition to organic. There, the first organic field was in 2015. And then the last of the acres, um, almost, uh, will be eligible this year. So we'll have nearly 4,000 acres under certified organic management. We produce things like popcorn, corn, soybean, oats, cereal rye, wheat, barley, oilseed, sunflower, and then played with other 
other crops. So here, here's just a shot of, of some organic popcorn, some organic soybeans, cleaning up this field. The, the weed escapes with a weed zapper here, which just rides over the, over the canopy of the soybeans to um, kill these weeds that, that have escaped and gotten over the canopy with, with electricity. Um, crop of cereal rye, we, we use small grains in rotation to get cover crops in to bring nitrogen into the system. We really try to minimize off-farm uh, fertility purchases, inputs, um, and try to use extensive rotations and cover crops to manage fertility in various agronomic um, aspects of the operation. So this cereal rye, we would have we would have raised for cover crop seed and for ourselves and some of the other farms in the community. And we interseed generally frost seed uh, a winter annual cereal like this with clovers, alfalfa, other legumes. Uh, the sunflower is something we're expanding acreage in. Uh, this is a field of rapeseed that we did um, on transition acres. And then we're also playing now with winter canola, which is a very similar crop on some organic acres. Another sort of solid seeded crop that is good in rotation, but trying to figure out how to manage it and, and find markets and make, you know, make it work financially for us. Uh, we like buckwheat, but no markets are available. We, we played with some buckwheat and would like to see if we can find markets to support that crop in rotation played with things like grain hemp that is no longer within the operation, just, just can't figure out how to make it work in an organic system for us. This is a shot of uh, clover and alfalfa coming through on one of those cereal crops that I mentioned, in this case, oats. Um, so that was, that was seeded directly with the oats in the spring. And um, that comes on and we'll either ride that for a year or two before we go to a high nitrogen demand crop like popcorn. And then we're also trying to develop more minimum tillage techniques uh, on crops that traditionally need tillage under organic management. So this is a strip till system we've been developing for popcorn into alfalfa and clover. And I'm happy to talk more about that, that system that we've worked to develop. Just a nice overhead shot of uh, an 80 acre section of uh, organic popcorn after it's laid by and waiting for harvest to come in a couple of months. And lastly, one of the things I wanted to share about my experience with the farm, last year I was very involved with operations and one of the things I enjoyed most was opportunities to get out on an open cab tractor, which is rare for this operation. We're generally in closed cabs, you know, comfortable in the tractor that you're operating for, for a lot of hours doing different operations. But this is when I, I got out on an older open air tractor with a bush hog and going around to some oat fields and other areas where we had some Canada thistle coming through that we wanted to mow down before it you know, flowered and set seed. So I was going through an oat field that was under seeded with clover and alfalfa, mowing down little patches of, of thistle here and there. And I came across, I mean, there were birds just everywhere, just feeding on insects and things coming off the field. Um, um, and I came across this uh, nest of, I believe, a red-winged blackbird that was beautifully woven into um, stalks of, of oats and some weeds. And there were, there were several of these in the field. And these kinds of experiences of seeing life really start to thrive and emerge in more diversity on the landscape of, of, like I said, that's otherwise mostly corn and soybeans under, under conventional management, I think is one of the most satisfying things to me. And I, it's just, it's to me, you know, this, this thriving of life is, is more beauty on the landscape. And for me, that's kind of a, an aspect of regenerative agriculture to reach for is, is sort of, you know, creating beauty in the landscapes and communities that we work within.
And it reminded me of a, a quote, this was shared back in like 2018 at one of the Indiana Small Farm Conference uh, pre-conference workshops. We had one on regenerative agriculture and Peter Allen was one of the speakers and he shared this, this definition of what's called concentric ecology. And I think it's sort of a mindset or a way of thinking that, that uh, regenerative agriculture kind of it relates to. It says indigenous, people view both themselves and nature as part of an extended ecological family that shares ancestry and origins is an awareness that life in any environment is viable only when humans view the life surrounding them as kin. The interactions that result from this concentric ecology enhance and preserve the ecosystem. Without human recognition of their role in the complexities of life in a place, the life suffers and loses its sustainability. skip that one. And so like uh, Karen shared, um, I read a lot and I like to share what I read and hear what other people are reading. And these are some books that not necessarily that I've read recently, some I, I have read recently, others have just informed my thinking for, for a lot of years. For example, Art of the Commonplace by Wendell Berry. Um, and specifically an essay that I revisited recently is The Whole Horse. And he talks about this, 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 difference between more of a industrial mechanical mindset relative to an agrarian mind uh, and it's very it's somewhat similar to a book I finished recently Charles Massey's called the Reef Warbler and he talks about shifting from in his work with farmers that he interviewed as part of this book um, farmers going from conventional to regenerative practices and how they manage their farms generally shift from this, this kind of Western mechanical industrial mindset into what he coins an emergent mindset where they're, they're allowing solutions to emerge from natural systems and processes uh, within the agricultural landscapes that they manage rather than this controlling uh, paradigm where they're trying to control every aspect of, of the the systems that they work with, the natural systems that they work with. Uh, and then another uh, one that I've gotten through recently is Charles Eisenstein's The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. And he talks about shifting from the story of separation to a story of interbeing. Um, I, won't, I won't dwell on that too much, but uh, just some books to throw out there that, that all seem to talk about this shift of mindset that I think is crucial to, to adopting more regenerative agricultural practices. And I'll, I'll just quote, I know I've been going for, for a little while, but I think, you know, I just wanted to share this to set the stage for our conversation. Uh, and this is a, a quote from Eisenstein. It's not from that book I mentioned, but a different, an essay that he penned recently. Uh, it says, another future beckons and won't be handed to us by the same authorities and systems that rule today. We have to claim it. We claim it through the choices it offers. Which future does your next step lead toward? Toward more normalization of the world un under control or toward the new normal I've described? And you'd have to read the essay to what he's referring to, but the road is forked. It is time to choose. And, and for me, it's more of holding a vision about an agriculture that we all feel is possible. Even if that agriculture doesn't come to be, that vision doesn't come to be during our life. It's like, what, what vision do we wanna take steps towards? Um, and the, the actions that we take on a daily basis to inform that and, and to try to make progress in that direction. And last, uh, I go to Twitter. Um, this is a guy I follow on Twitter, um, Scott Hawk. Farms out out west does um, uh, regenerative grazing practices. I really like this quote he put up because I think that this kind of gets to the heart of of these mindset shifts um, that I think are crucial to how we relate to the land and the life that we work with. It says that nature calls me to work on the land and on myself. I started with the former and discovered the latter. All right, so. That's what I got, and I look forward to conversation. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, let's see, you may need to stop the screen share. There you go. 
Um, so yeah, I think that sets the table well for our discussion today. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and as all you, you all can see, we have a very diverse uh, panel today, um, very knowledgeable. Um, so looking forward to hearing from them. And again, please chime in with questions in the chat box. Um, so first, uh, for our more organized questions, regenerative agriculture is a very broad topic, um, and it encompasses a lot of different things. And we have certainly covered different aspects of regenerative agriculture throughout our years of doing this conference, but I believe this is the first time a, a track was actually devoted to the topic. Um, so just as a further background for everyone, um, I am curious from each of our panelists, um, how do you define regenerative agriculture? And then kind of as a follow-up, uh, just kind of expand on why are its practices a priority for you on your farm or in your um, consultation consultations? Um, Elliot, would you care to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I really liked Michael's uh, note there on concentric, maybe it was energy. Um, the idea, I think, of regenerative ag is, you know, not just to preserve your farm, which, you know, could be soil, could be how you control water on your farm, your infrastructure, just the whole system, but really to enhance it, I think, is, is important. That's, I, I believe, a, a key feature of regenerative ag is to make make your farm better for the next generation and even the next generation after that. And um, there's a lot of different techniques that I know like Karen mentioned her, you know, system she works in, which seems like a lot of really neat permaculture is I think one of the best ways to do that. Um, but, you know, everybody has their own farm. Every farm is kind of set up in a different style you know, different management ideas are going to be a part of that. But, um, you know, for me, the idea of regenerative ag is pretty much making it, enhancing it and preserving it. Like Michael's definition kind of stated, I thought really hit it. And, you know, why is that a priority? Well, imagine if you didn't do that. I mean, what condition would your farm be in for, the next generation of farmers. You know, it just, I think it has to be a priority. I don't see any other way to farm. If you don't farm like that, you know, it's it's just not gonna be good for the future of humanity, the future of the ecology and, you know, just the, the world in general. So I don't really see any other way to farm, but, you know, every, like I said, every farm's different. Every farm is gonna have a different way to manage it regeneratively. And, and some people, you know, want to farm conventionally and, and not focus on regenerative stuff. You know, that's their decision. But um, I, I think it's a priority with agriculture and always should be. Yes, excellent, Elliot. Um, Karen, would you care to expand on that at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to build off of everything that Elliot had just shared. And uh, I'd like to take it um, in the direction of going, like, what does regenerative ag mean to me? I want to start with what does regeneration mean? Like, what does regenerative actually mean? And from this ecological and biological definition, regenerative and regeneration, it's more or less a signal or it's an indication of restoration. So it's just a, it's a signifier, it's an indicator. And if you want to go into the bio biology of it, it goes into uh, the ability for cells, tissues, organisms, and then going even bigger than that, ecosystems to have the capacity to recover from damage, uh, being able to replenish themselves from like in an ecosystem or a farm <laughs> that is working in context of ecosystems, the ability for that system to recover, replenish, like if it's been grazed, that recovery period of what's being eaten, uh, our disturbance patterns, harvesting. So um, in, I guess in summation, uh, rege regenerative ag is related to, uh, it's a signal of the outcome of restoration. 
And so by restoration, I'm going from an ecological standpoint again. And when I'm talking about restoration, that's more of like an umbrella of ecosystem health. And restoration is a process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, and so I feel that regenerative agriculture, it brings upon the folks who took on the vocation of being a, a farmer in this category. Uh, it carries that responsibility of farmers uh, because we play such a huge role in creating these conditions for these ecological communities of in part of what we're contriving in these farming systems that are also nested in the greater uh, eco regions, these greater ecological communities that we are part. And uh, I feel that, uh, again, it's more of regenerative ag, it's discussing uh, the roles and responsibilities of that farmers have a huge role in uh, to help uh, these ecosystems carry on the recovery uh, and just condone a trajectory of overall health. And so I think that, so we have these practices of like how we want to navigate each and every property is going to uh, be a little bit different. Each landscape has its own uh, behavior, so to speak, its own trajectory, like its own set of patterns that we can all recognize. Um, there's different, um, like a desert you can see is <laughs> like dry lands is going to like where Scott Hawk lives. Um, out in Southwest Colorado, like he's got a different set of constraints and other things that are part of his drylands eco region where he is, which is significantly different compared to the higher water <laughs> uh, precipitation and the karst habitat, the prairies, uh, the woodlands and all these interesting dynamics going on across the whole state of Indiana. And so we're doing more context specific uh, agriculture and basically opening our eyes as farmers, um, regenerative agriculture, being a practitioner thereof, you're just working with uh, honoring like where the general trajectory of the system is and navigating where your niche is. Thank you, Karen. Um, Michael, any, anything to add to that? Yeah, so we were just sharing further thoughts on our, our thoughts on just how we define regenerative ag. Is that right? Yeah, how you define yeah. it and then why it's why it's important to you. Yeah. Well, I think you guys got quite a bit of my philosophy and thinking <laughs> about this topic in, in general. Um, but I guess just stepping back when you look at kind of the mainstream conversation around regenerative agriculture it's often closely tied to soil health. And I think, I think if, you, if you read any sort of mainstream ag article or a presentation about regenerative agriculture, you're gonna hear about the, depending on who's presenting, you're gonna hear about a certain number of principles of regenerative agriculture or soil health, whether it's four or five or six. And the ones I generally hear are like, you know, keep the soil covered, you know, minimize, disturbance, increase diversity, maintain a living plant, living roots, and integrate livestock. And then people may throw in like, know your context of how you are gonna apply these principles. And that's kind of, you know, it, it's this close linkage between regenerative and soil health. Um, but that's often what you hear from people when they talk about a definition of, of regenerative agriculture. And there's a lot of permutations around that, but. One thing I think Karen was starting to starting to get at is that I think oftentimes we get um, the, the the regenerative discussion gets stuck in these aspects of, of just soil health and farm level regeneration or whatever. And one thing that I feel is crucial to this whole conversation that maybe I I touched on I don't know is is um, or the, that gets lost sometimes is the, the, the human element and the, like the community element of regeneration. Um, <clears throat> in terms of human health 
and community health. And we look at what the trajectory of our agricultural systems, you know, how that's played out uh, and the, how that's um, led some of our rural agricultural communities to where they are today, often somewhat depopulated because of fewer people needed to operate on these lands, to operate the, the, the agricultural systems on these landscapes. And then the, the, the towns in these, these rural areas are oftentimes somewhat, um, I don't know what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, they're not thriving, I guess I, guess I could say. Um, and that just maintaining basic services within these communities becomes problematic. Accessing good food in these communi communities is difficult. You know, when I spend time living in, in Walkit, when I'm there help, helping with operations, because I don't live right there at the farm, um, you know, there's, there's no grocery store anywhere nearby. There's, you know, I, I got to go down to Lafayette to find a grocery store that has a decent selection of food. Um, you know, so, so living within a, a landscape, an agricultural community or landscape that can't support basic quality of life, um, you know, aspects of a good quality of life, I think is, is problematic. And so I hope that our discussions around regenerative systems expand to consider the, these broader implications, not just the environmental or farm level productivity and, and farm viability aspects, but these broader community uh, dynamics that have played out. Um, can, we, can we regenerate thriving rural agricultural communities through adopting these, these practices at the farm level? So. Yeah, I just want to throw that into the conversation. That, yeah, great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for bringing up the, the communities. Um, yeah, we drive through some of the same towns. Um, and so it can be a little depressing sometimes, especially as you hear about, you know, some of these towns that were thriving, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, how things have, have changed despite being surrounded by all this productive agriculture. Um, before we move on to our, our next question, um, Tamara, I see you have your hand raised. Um, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I, it was just a question because um, I have to run out of here and teach a class. Um, I, I'm So I'm really interested right now in what you were talking about, Michael, about the birds that you were seeing in the fields. And US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nature Conservancy and others are really interested in can we tweak regenerative practices to possibly um, increase migratory bird habitat or other flora or other fauna, things like that. And, you know, when you think about it, um, there's like a time to hay, but can we tweak that at all to like maybe make sure that there are um, birds that are nesting in, you know, prairie lands so that we don't disrupt that, that um, their bird nesting times. Or are there place times when, you know, we shouldn't be out working when things are flying through and they just need some, um, uh, you know, s space from humans, that kind of thing. Uh, and I know you were talking about that, but I'm just curious um, if all three of you have seen that your regenerative practices have increased or improved habitat, or you've seen other birds. And, you know, we're really talking about it right now because of last year, all of the songbird death as well. It, you know, there's a huge concern about is traditional agriculture negatively impacting some of these um, populations. And I'm curious if regenerative agriculture, maybe it's not the perfect answer, but we'll have to tweak it a bit, but just thoughts on that. And then I'm sorry, I have to leave, but I wanna hear your answer. That's why I put my hand up, Andrew. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in first. I mean, your last comment there about, you know, our current sort of conventional production systems and impact on migratory songbirds. I mean, there's, there's published peer reviewed articles, at least one that I know of from some researchers out of Canada, looking exactly at this issue because a lot of those migratory songbirds in, end up in Canada uh, when their agricultural production's in full swing. And specifically, some of that research is looking at how neonicotinoid seed treatments um, that end up within the soil water solution move towards wetland ecosystems in the landscape and then these migratory songbirds that feed on insects in those wetland ecosystems become a route of exposure to those um, 
songbirds that are feeding on the insects that are within that, that wetland ecosystem exposed to neonicotinoids, which is you know, systemic. Uh, and then those those songbirds then feed on these insects and are exposed to the neonic neonicotinoids, and then that's having adverse impacts on their health and and population and whatnot. So so there's there's clear, you know, there's research published research that shows that connection. Um, but you know, at at the farm in Walkit, I mean, you know, it's it's not a ton of years into this type of management, and you know, I'll acknowledge it, it's still. You know, it's still an annual cropping system, which is disruptive, even though we're trying to develop, you know, we, we've eliminated the use of synthetic um, pesticides and herbicides. We're, we're trying to develop cropping techniques that have less soil, less, less invasive soil disturbance, but that's still a reality for us to raise productive crops. But one thing we're actively looking at, and we're working specifically with Pheasants Forever and a farm bill biologist who works with Pheasants Forever is their program called Precision Conservation Management. And we're, we're looking at the farm for more of a, a landscape level design approach, looking um, you know, at, the, at all of our fields, and looking strategically at how we can implement conservation practices within the farmscape um, that will be perennial, essentially perennial habitat of different types. And then thinking strategically about how we can take advantage of some of the USDA programs that would support that. Um, so, so we'll be looking strategically at buffer areas, uh, integrating strips of perennials in certain fields that, that sort of break up the field and create refuge um, as we're moving through these annual cropping cycles. And then also looking at um, the productivity of fields and identifying areas that are perennially underperforming uh, that we can put into habitat and that will be, you know, so, so that rather than putting money and time and operations in the areas that just don't ever perform well because they either stay too dry or too wet, we put into habitat and this, this becomes another permanent refuge area uh, within the landscape. So those are things that we're working on. Thanks, Michael, and thanks for the question, Tamara. Um, Karen or Elliot, do you have anything to add? I feel like I have bucket loads, at least anecdotally speaking, uh, to this topic. Uh, just with the hazelnuts alone that have been on the farm here, uh, when I'm out in the process of harvesting, I already know just from analyzing and just checking out what's going on. Like they're, It's like they're a uh, biodiverse condominium complex is like full of insects, spiders, and all kinds of critters at different instars of development, which is attracting the tree frogs. And then pretty much every other shrub literally had a bird nest in it. And right now on the farm, just the songbirds are absurd. Like it's just, that's what wakes me up in the morning. Uh, so we are a migratory songbird hub and the hazelnuts in and of themselves because they're a native shrub for much of this continent. Um, it's, there's a long uh, evolutionary history of those shrubs being a part of this, you know, here and there across like different uh, eco regions here. And uh, also we're probably concentrating more birds than would typically be expected simply because uh, we're completely surrounded by just conventional corn and soybean farmers. And so the landscape across the street that I'm looking at right now, it's it's corn stubble. I can see bare soil. There's no home for these things. And so I look behind me, just they're all over the place. Um, and so for us, uh, if in the locations on this farm here where we do occasionally do some tillable agriculture, like there's a, uh, an area, it's maybe a couple of acres, but we honestly have been decommissioning it because um, this might lead into a separate conversation we might get into. Uh, if not, maybe we'll have to schedule another time <laughs> to do that. Uh, but the, taking the footprint of this hundred or so acre farm and uh, respecting and understanding the fact that we're just 
as living organisms, all of us are consumers of something. We have to drive energy. <laughs> it's like we have to obtain it and uh, move it around in some fashion. And so the scale of disruption, when I look across the road, um, those farmers, they're absolutely proud of the way that they're performing their corn and crop production. Uh, but what we know is that there was intact oak hickory savanna all across this region in the driftless. And so we had to completely annihilate these intact functioning healthy ecosystems in order for them to pat themselves on the back and feel like they're contributing food. Uh, there's no place for these critters anymore. It's like, for me, it, it's like, why? And so that kind of goes into maybe the spiritual components, like why uh, it feels like they severed these inherent connections. Like these intact ecosystems, they're a plethora of uh, moving around connections. There's uh, energy flow, there's relationships, call it be whatever you will but that has been completely disrupted. So now um, the compare and contrast, it's just, it's acres, it's like hundreds of acres of demolished uh, what was formerly intact ecosystems. And now it's, it's like, there's no, like, why would anything want to be there? But going back to this farm here, um, this hundred acre little footprint, um, maybe a couple of acres worth was at any point in, so less than 10% of this whole entirety of this whole place, uh, it was disturbed, like it was tilled. So uh, I think there can be a balance stricken between uh, our disturbance patterns and the way in which we, we go into that. And so that's what we're mindful of over when we're doing our agricultural practices. So what proportion based on where we live, so here, Historically, uh, there's a lot of evidence indicating oak hickory savanna in our context. And so proportionally, um, there were annuals in that system, but how much and how did those disturbances show up? So those provide uh, some means with which to help us as farmers have more uh, confidence and having more responsible land management choices that we're making. So total, go for tillable agriculture. But um, do we want to do 400 acres worth with respect, you know, is that 100% of your farm? Is that 50%? Is that 10%? 5%? So, and just being understanding like where that aligns you in this overall uh, housing, in this overall trajectory of where the greater eco region like wants to evolve into. Okay, uh, great conversation. Um, I'm going to move on down the list here a little bit, but Elliot, if you have things to add um, to that, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to say something. I, I guess sure. Karen really hit home with what I wanted to mention. With, there's really got to be some balance for your ecology. And if you want to create habitat for birds, that the annual type system that maybe Michael's kind of doing, it's really probably not quite as conducive as the permaculture system. Uh, we established a 40 acre CRP program along the Wabash River five years ago. And what I've noticed the past few years is that you go out there during nesting season and it's just full of birds and nesting and, and uh, it, you just don't see that in a row crop field, even if it's organic, even if you've got like a two-year cover crop system or hay fields, you know, you're constantly disturbing hay fields. You've got to make hay when the sun shines. You can't wait for them to choose their nesting season and really work around that. So the permaculture system is by far, I think, a more ideal scenario to support wildlife habitat. But, you know, at the same time, I just did a quick calculation on like the small eight acres that I currently farm, only 2% of it is really being disturbed for vegetable production. So there does have to be a balance of, you know, what you're disturbing and what you're leaving in perennials um, to provide, you know, nature with that nesting habitat, with food and what they need to survive. Okay, excellent. Um, so, 
we've talked about some of the uh, many of the benefits of regenerative ag practices, um, both philosophical and as far as your um, your uh, your farms go. Um, but I'm curious as you speak to farmers, small and diversified farmers around the state of Indiana, um, what kind of challenges have you faced while implementing these practices? And these could be through, you know, things like your ag systems management um, or even economic challenges um, that you've experienced. Um, and I'll just throw it right back to you, Elliot, if you have anything. Okay. Uh, challenges for me, the biggest challenge I probably face is I'd say pests on our farm, since we're mainly a vegetable farm um, and we're organic. So, you know, my big struggle is, is keeping pests away from our crops um, organically and using, trying to use perennial systems to do that. And, and I've had many uh, people out to help me with this problem. Have I really found an answer to it? I think I'm still kind of working through that. Um, so can't really say I can answer how to fix that problem, but that's what I struggle with most probably. Uh, I do think that, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for us with trying to get some more kind of pollinator things going on. And, and we do use a lot of row covers because I, I try not to spray at all. I know there's organic sprays you can use out there. I prefer not to use any. So we're, we're really kind of starting to implement a lot of netting, um, which is extremely labor intensive. So kind of struggle with that as well. But that's by far my biggest struggle on our farm. Hey, that makes sense. Um, Karen, anything to add to that from your experience? Yeah, I'll riff off of that uh, going with pests. And for us, uh, we have a system that we're not, we're fearless of pests and diseases. And our system is because we modeled this as an ecosystem mimic of an oak hickory savanna. So we have come to expect that pests will be around. And I can't attest to this ultra specifically, but it's a stat that I think for every uh, notable insect pest that you might find in your cropping system, there's like an average of 1600 like beneficial ones, like those wasps that'll go after them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, having that intact ecosystem as best as we can at play, um, they're helping with that pest situation. But what we've come across is um, it's a paradigm shift as it relates to pest control, as it relates to production. And all of that I feel is tied to economics uh, money because we're a part of this greater uh, dominant uh, economic base <laughs> that's based off of scarcity. It's based off of uh, like limits of production. And so we were doing this dance <laughs> Uh, this is from what I'm observing of why it's difficult for other people to get involved with that because they're going toggling between like, well, I have these economic realities I have to deal with. I want to do good unto the planet. However, if I have an abundance of birds eating all the berries off of my <laughs> berries in my orchard, um, it's and so what that amounts to happening in folks, it kind of goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs in a way. Um, it's just, if you're, it's like the lower on that basal level, like if we can't get our basic needs met of like getting the food and these, the shelter and stuff, we're kind of stressed out a lot. And so people are definitely not motivated to take a risk into uh, leaning into a more natural regenerative based system. Uh, unless they get enough help. And so the other constraint that I've observed, uh, I appreciate uh, these, um, like the CRP programs and things like that, but I, what I'm looking for is more communication, more feedback amongst said organizations as it relates to helping people transition to uh, a regenerative ag model. And because, uh, the equipment people might be starting off with like you're financially like set like I'm taking I'm picking on those neighbors across the street pretty hard this time uh with the corn farmers 
like they're vulnerable, like they're limited. They can't pivot like we can with regenerative ag based systems quite as readily. They may be saddled with thousands, if not million do- millions of dollars in uh, investment into uh, harvesting material or uh, equipment, uh, storage equipment and things like that. And so that's where we that I loved how Michael brought up the the community component, like the rural economy issues that we're facing. Um, it just it all kind of collapses onto itself. So heck yeah, that's scary. <laughs> so I think a lot of these issues they're very much tied to the dominant economic model as it as it's here, and it's not helping us move out of a fear <laughs> of failure because definitely. A lot of us, like our lives depend on this being successful, even if it's a gradual uh, systemic failure that we're experiencing. Yeah. Um, Michael, anything to add from your experiences? Yeah, I'll just speak to the farm that I currently work with and and some of the things that were shared. Um, What Karen was saying about you know, the annual cropping, row cropping um, economic realities is, is, is very, very real. And I think one of the compounding factors there is the, um, at least in our state, the majority of land being, being leased and it creates this short-term mindset um, of cash flow that essentially forces you into year-to-year thinking of an operation rather than cultivating that longer-term mindset. And uh, the ability to support that, uh, and so this idea of yeah, how do we how do we create mechanisms to better support the transition uh, into more regenerative systems is a, is a big question on my mind, and I don't have all the answers by any means. You know, the operation that I work with uh, has taken on a lot of risk. It would have been very easy for the farm owner to just you know stay within a conventional corn soybean system and not make this kind of change because the incentives and structures around that uh, are essentially a disincentive to change. You know, the the crop insurance mechanisms, uh, the direct payment systems, the ag lending norms and understanding of, of ag lenders within our area, all of that reinforces um, (laughs) or disincentivizes change and adoption of these types of practices. So uh, for me to have the opportunity to work with an operation like this, that's making this kind of change and transition, though it's still, you know, an annual cropping system and some of the challenges that that presents where where perhaps we need to think more about perennialization, you know, I feel very grateful to work with this kind of operation. But some of the things we face to support the, the goals that we have that align with regenerative is uh, two things that come up in my mind would be labor and market opportunities. Um, so, you know, we, we need more labor to, op- to, to, to manage this scale of, of an operation um, under organic management and some of the, the other principles that we're using to inform our production practices and Finding good help um, that wants to do this kind of work that can be very intensive at certain times, not your nine to five, under within an economy where um, there's a lot of demand for labor and a lot of industries paying very good wages, it's hard to find people. And so we're faced this year with looking at getting help from overseas. So we've applied for a couple of visas to get help to get some skilled operators from another country. And that's just the reality that we face right now. And there are several other um, operations, a lot of operations in our state. And I'm learning more throughout our agricultural system. And, And, you know, we traditionally think of a lot of the specialty crop areas out west that are very reliant on migrant labor, but I'm learning more and more that, that here in the Midwest and the, the, the South, that this is becoming more of a reality. 
And, and so I'm seeing that right now with the farm that I work with. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it, it, it's a decision that we were faced with. And then markets, um, even though we've shifted into certified organic production, corn and soybeans still rule. If we're looking at just, just um, the market opportunities and the financial returns, uh, corn and soybeans still dominate. And so yet we know that the way we want to manage this farm and that's going to be sustainable over the long term and support more regenerative practices is not a corn, corn and soybean dominated uh, cropping system. And so finding market opportunities for diverse crops that help us sustain the financial viability of the operation is a big puzzle that we continue to work through and try to balance right now and exploring some value add enterprises that uh, we might um, make some investments into better support diverse crops and get us working directly with some food businesses more locally and regionally um, is, is something that we're exploring. So yeah, for us, it's, it's labor, help, you know, more people, you know, making this, a, make, making this farm an attractive place for people to work. Um, and then also market opportunities and cultivating markets that can support a diverse cropping system. Okay, um, thank you all. So yeah, we talked about some of the, the economic challenges that you all touched on. And as Ashley put in the, the chat, you know, sometimes it's not simple, as simple as just doing this transition because it comes down to the you know, your bottom line in terms of, of income a lot of times. Have you guys noticed any uh, economic benefits to these practices that you can kind of encourage people to look towards? Um, Elliot, I'll go back to you. I've noticed, I feel like uh, maybe not so much of the economic benefit, but as far as marketing and, and our economies on the farm is I've felt kind of encouraged that, you know, there is a nice market for mainly our produce and mushrooms for uh, people wanting to see that, like, that's the way you're farming. If you're not farming um, regeneratively, then it, it kind of throws some questions up, like, well, how are they farming and what, you know, practices are they using? What's that mean for the environment? So um, a lot of our customers I, I think would probably potentially not purchase as many products from us if they thought we were to farm in a different way. And um, so marketing has definitely been, I'd say easier for us. Um, and economically, you know, to change from, if you were in a conventional system to change into more, you know, regenerative system, I think that you definitely have to worry about, you know, making a very slow transition and make sure that, you know, your finances are in order before you make the transition, because there will be, you know, some loss in revenue as you're transitioning portions of your farm into this regenerative style. So that's definitely something to consider if this is a, you know, method that some farms and some other small farmers want to move into. Yeah, Karen, how about your experiences? Anything to add? Uh, in terms of economic benefits of yeah. generative ag system, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we might be the contrarians of the whole group, I'm not sure. I very much see regenerative agriculture and these practices that we engage in, they're very much strengths in our system um, because what I see is people who practice regenerative ag, we seek feedback to improve the overall system. It's like, so the very like nature's operating system like that, to me, that's the ultimate of technology. And so usually technology in our world that usually diminishes in value, like how many Apple iPhones came out like this year? I don't know. Um, but you catch my drift with that, I think. Over at the farm, um, that economic benefits had come through more on a personal level because um, a lot of it's more of a paradigm shift that happened in my world where um, like, where do I value my time? Like where does, when I am earning money, like what do I put it towards? It's like usually like insurance or like different types of payments like that. 
And, you know, if you're doing your taxes, you get to, you get to be faced with that stuff pretty readily. And so I noticed uh, I value quality food quite a bit. And so uh, engaging with these kinds of regenerative egg systems, I have security with food <laughs> where it's coming from. Um, and so I basically have like, um, for the minor, ex relatively minor expenses of raising cattle, pork, like chicken, like these kinds of basic livestock uh, in this system, it's conducive to oyster mushroom cultivation, shiitakes, and a lot of these other things that round out. Uh, and then the privilege of being able to eat hazelnuts and chestnuts, like perennial tree crops. Uh, and now the spring greens are showing up. So my choice, my paradigm shifted choices of trying to live more in context to this environment, eating seasonally. Um, it's like that, that in and of itself, it dramatically lowered those expenses. And going into the economic benefits uh, that goes all the way back into how the farm infrastructure had been put together. The farm, we kind of, this hasn't been brought up yet, I don't think, but in a way we're, we're real estate managers. And so in this, economy of uh, the way to generate wealth a really surefire way is procuring real estate generally speaking it increases in value over time and so there's tools of the trade that we employ in order to make some little leverage points so we get to farm we get to do regenerative agriculture meaning we get to do uh, uh, just our land stewardship practices and thereby take care of our basic needs. So my shelter is taken care of, my fuel with the wood burning stove and you know, heating up a house and being able to cook food, getting a nutritious food for myself, my family. Like for me, like, and that's kind of going into more of a value system, like what, what drives me. Um, and so also this farm has, uh, so going back into the real estate model, like this, um, Whoa, <laughs> so I have a chair here that <laughs> tipped me back. Um, the overall infrastructure, uh, I think, is a new avenue that I'd love to engage into more conversations about, but there's certain economic um, components that are at play that everybody has the capacity to more or less to participate in or at least learn about. <laughs> there's uh, so meaning that um, we held this farm here, it's in a limited partnership. And so that has a certain types of qualities that determine like how money gets passed around, how that flows. And so that allows for us to have um, like a schedule F and a schedule C. So the schedule F's for the farm, farming entity. And so we also had the nursery headquartered here, right? We had the consultancy con uh, headquartered here. So we're basically cheap renters of this real estate holding. And so we're developing this economic ecosystem where there's a mixture of uh, businesses in which their overall interactions and participations with the landscape itself, this real estate holding improves the overall asset. And um, so for people like maybe someone wants to have like a herbal business here. There used to be a cidery here. We're actually bringing on uh, a new couple of folks who are going to be cultivating uh, culinary mushrooms um, on the farm infrastructure here. So for that example, they're generating like, so we have a rent basic rental agreement with them. So they're in charge of this. They're in charge of that. And this is how it's like, so we structure the means of interaction as best as we can but their overall participation on this property here, I feel that it's a strong uh, benefit. Great I'm point. Trying to <laughs> I get really enthusiastic about this. This is uh, really exciting uh, in that kind of way for me. You're good. Okay, Michael, anything else? Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, Boy, so many, so many different directions I could go. Um, the the real estate aspect is intriguing, but for me, you know, for a lot of people, 
particularly in, in this landscape with the farm that I work with, the idea of me accumulating much in the way of, of land personally, um, separate from building, if, if, if there are opportunities to build equity within the operation myself, you know, with where land prices have gone, particularly over the last year, it's, it's, it's out of reach. But uh, again, I'm grateful to be working with an, an operation like this. And I, I would just say that um, I think as more tradition, what, what I call traditional farms, at least within Indiana, um, perhaps begin to explore different pathways out of um, you know, corn, soybean, and, and the more traditional production systems that we've seen, I, I think that more opportunities like the one that I've been able to uh, take on with this farm are going, going to emerge. I, I think that as farms pursue different paths and need not just more labor operationally, you know, to, to plant crops, tend to crops, livestock, harvest, et cetera, but, you know, bringing different skill sets from a management perspective, you know, I was brought on the farm, not because I'm a skilled operator, but because um, of just my knowledge of organic cropping systems, you know, managing all the certification, the record keeping, helping with crop planning and agronomics, marketing. Um, these types of opportunities as farms change and are generally just operated by, you know, a father, a son, maybe a, a grandpa, whatever, you know, a, a limited number of people they're going to need more skilled people with diverse skill sets. And I, I think we're going to see more opportunities emerge like that across the, the agricultural landscape where um, you might think, you know, you might think it's weird with the idea of going to work for a large um, farming operation, but I, I really think these are opportunities that we could see coming about. So to me, that that is a benefit of more farm shifting to regenerative practices that we're gonna see the need for more people to be on the landscape, whether that's in a more management type role or directly involved with, with operations and labor. Um, yeah, one of the things that we're looking at, you know, for the farm moving forward as we get more comfortable with the, the cropping system that we're managing um, is, is adding even more diversity. So in our rotation, we, we actually don't call it a rotation. We like to call it like an adaptive cropping system because we're, we're not just following a set rotation and going round and round and round every three years, four years, five years, whatever. We're, we're taking into account a lot of different variables to inform sort of a sequence of cropping. And one of the things we like to include is sort of an adaptive component in there um, of a of full year um, soil building with diverse cover crops. Um, and then to us, that, that how can we add value in those, those parts of our rotation or crop sequencing? And the obvious thing is, is um, integration of livestock. So this farm doesn't have any infrastructure to support livestock at the time. Um, but that's something we're exploring and whether that's something we develop internally as an enterprise to this farm business or we seek partnerships with another business that perhaps can build equity in cattle, grass-fed beef, and we've got the land and the cover crop or whatever that we want to, you know, or perennial phase in our rotation or crop sequence that we want to add value to. It'd be great if we could just develop partnerships like that. If there's there's somebody who's wanting to start or expand a grass-fed beef operation, we'd love to see how we can partner and integrate so we can both build each other's um, businesses and opportunities. You know, this is a pipe dream of mine. Like, I'd love for there to be somebody who's into like wool sheep, and uh, uh, we start having like, and perhaps our humidity and stuff is just totally not good for this kind of thing, but you know, having regeneratively raised um, wool uh, to make high quality wool clothing, because I'm big into wool clothing. It's like, it's all coming from like Ireland or, you know, South America or New Zealand. And, um, you know, let's have some regenerative wool clothing right here in Indiana. But <laughs> I'm, I'm getting off track here. Um, more directly currently in terms of the farm shifting in this direction, I'd say that the two direct economic benefits would be access to the premiums that the organic marketplace currently offers. 
Um, and then secondly, the, these more extensive, the, the more extensive cropping diversity and cover cropping practices that we're adopting um, have significantly reduced input costs and input purchases. Okay, thank you for that, everybody. Um, so we're kind of winding down here, unfortunately. Um, I have a few more questions here, um, but we have some participants online. I'd like to open it up to see if there are any questions um, out there amongst them. Um, we're slated to go till 1.30. Uh, this will be recorded. So if we go into overtime a little bit, um, you'll be able to catch up. I know our panelists are very busy. Um, so if you need to hop off here in the next four or five minutes, we completely understand. Um, but I did want to open it up to see if there are any questions out there for our panelists. You can utilize the chat box or just chime in. I'll, I'll, if, if we're waiting for people to chime in or there aren't questions, I guess one other thing that I was reminded of on this question about economics is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now around the regenerative space of carbon markets and ecosystem markets. And, you know, we're seeing all these attempts to support those in various ways. And um, there's a lot of opinions out there. And I'm finding that, you know, the farm I work with and some similar farms are quite reluctant and hesitant about, about a lot of these schemes. And, um, you know, I, I guess for me, from a more philosophical standpoint, my concerns are around this idea of, of placing our economic, you know, financial uh, accounting on ecosystem processes, soil organic carbon, and all the, the, the things that that fosters within our production systems uh, could inherently, like trying to price these things, cost these things, and pay, pay businesses for these things is, has the potential to inherently um, undervalue them. And I, um, if, if you might um, entertain me, uh, again, with, with more literature, because I, I really like to look at literature and stuff. There's a poem by this poet, Jared K. Anderson in the Field Guide to the Haunted Forest. The poem is titled Worthless. And when I read this, I thought exactly about this thing of carbon markets and ecosystem markets. Um, so yeah, worthless. One dangerous illusion of modernity is the link between cost and value. Could we afford the true cost of rain? Can we calculate a price for the work of phytoplankton producing the oxygen we need? Our survival will require us to understand value independent of cost. So I think that touches on a lot of things that we discussed here and it by no means provides any solution, but it's, it's just another kind of thought provoking thing as we, we talk about all these things that swirl around the regenerative agriculture conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, with no questions coming in the chat, Elliot, do you have any closing comments or, or anything you'd like to add before we, um, before we go? Uh, nothing. I, uh, really in particular i just think both michael and karen really kind of hit home on a lot of you know key aspects of regenerative regenerative agriculture and you know one of your last questions was you know are there any other benefits to that we would maybe share to encourage other farmers to kind of adopt these practices you know um uh, like I said earlier, every farm is a little different. You know, some of these ideas just might not fit into your your climate or your zone or your personal life goals. Um, but you know, the the regenerative style of farming is is definitely 
very pleasurable and it's, you know, not just good for your economics or, but like Michael said, the community, it's something that's really important, I think, for the future of farming and especially here in Indiana, but also throughout the U.S. that I'd say if anybody was interested in, in pursuing it, it's um, just been an all around awesome experience for me. And I really enjoy, enjoyed learning more and more about it and being part of discussions like this. So I uh, just want to say thanks, everybody, for letting me be a part of this. And I've really enjoyed this. Thanks, Elliot. Karen, do you have any closing comments? I'd like to thank Purdue University, you and for everybody for setting up this panel. And uh, if there's anyone uh, here or who sees the recording later, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, there's, I could talk for days about uh, the value that I've received from participating and farming in this way. And for me, there's absolutely no going back. <laughs> Uh, I came from uh, a really cushy suburban lifestyle where I had the house, I had the white picket fence, I had this awesome job at a top 10 university, I had amazing health insurance, but yet it's like that still wasn't fulfilling in such a way that this regenerative egg trajectory has taken me. And so I'm here for you guys as a resource uh, to uh, or to confide in because uh, like everybody has addressed in their own ways so far, community is a gosh darn big deal as it relates to this, especially with the early adopters in this community. Um, it's nice to just highlight and be lighthouses for each other. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Karen, for joining us. Uh, Michael, any final thoughts? I think my closing with the poem is I, I think it's fitting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, so again, unfortunately, we are out of time today. I want to thank each of our panelists again, Elliot Dale, Karen Vanek, and Michael O'Donnell for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, normally I'd ask for um a round of applause. Um, perhaps we can all go down to the the reaction spot on the on the Zoom feature here and clap our hands or throw something into the chat box um, for them. We greatly appreciate their time and wisdom. Um, I'm going to hopefully smoothly uh, pull up one more slide here for us to close out. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay, it looks like it's up. Um, so if you could um, just take a moment to scan this QR code once again, or click on the link that James put in the chat box. Um, this is for our actual survey of the program. The earlier one was the demographic survey. Um, this one is to let us know how we did. Uh, we take a really close look at these each year and it really helps us guide us as far as how to structure the conference for the coming years. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. Um, and I'll leave this up for just a moment so you all can capture that. Um, also wanted to take a moment to remind everyone that Purdue University is an equal opportunity provider. And lastly, uh, please go ahead and save the date for next year's Small Farms Conference, which will be held March 3rd through 5th at our traditional location of Hendricks, the Hendricks County Fairgrounds in Danville, Indiana. Um, I felt like we have a lot, got through a lot of things today, but um, hopefully we can get some of our panelists back again um, next year because I think they would have a lot to share. Um, so in closing, I just wanted to say that I hope you all have a smooth and productive spring and a successful rest of the year. Um, as issues come up, please don't hesitate to reach out to your local Purdue Extension office or any one of us on the Diversified Farm and Food Systems team. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of the day and uh, take care. Thank you.